Today's guest is well-versed when it comes to health care, patient safety, and patient advocacy, and will be a contributor to a chapter within my new charity, Patient Safety Anthology, titled Highway to Heart, Humor and Honesty in Healthcare. She is Dr. Annette Tecoris. Annette is the owner, advocate of Guided Patient Services Incorporated, GPS. In 2014, she founded GPS to serve an unmet need in the Columbus, Ohio area for private patient advocacy and navigation. After years of training and practice as an internal medicine physician, she was able to build on her past experiences and personal passion to serve patients in a unique capacity. She firmly believes that there is a peace of mind and empowerment that comes with greater understanding of one's own health care. In today's healthcare maze, patients and families need a translator of sorts, a processor of great volumes of health information, and that is the primary focus with GPS clients. Dr. Tecoris wants clients to fully comprehend their medical situation so that they may make their own best choices regarding their health and well-being. And in 2018, she became one of the first board-certified patient advocates and maintains an active Ohio medical license. She volunteers in her local church and community groups and is involved with multiple age-friendly initiatives in Central Ohio. And I am so happy to share a fellow Ohio guest with you. So welcome to the show, Annette. Thank you. I'm very happy to be here. I am very happy to have you here as well. We're not far from each other, and one of these days we'll have to meet. Absolutely. Yep. Now, Annette, I've had nurses turned patient advocate, not too many physician turned patient advocates. So if you don't mind just to set the stage for who you are and what you do, what caused you to become a board certified patient advocate? I think anyone who is in the healthcare field will say that they've been an advocate all along, even while they were practicing their chosen profession. And I think that was very much the case uh, for me in primary care. It was the part of medicine that I enjoyed the most, the advocating, kind of the soft side of medicine, empowering my patients, helping them understand uh, their health care in terms that they could understand. Did that throughout my practice, took some time off to raise three beautiful children, and knew that when I returned, I wanted to do it in more of the capacity of education or empowerment or advocacy. So um, I came back to medicine at just the exact perfect time to um, sort of embrace this new profession of advocacy and navigation. Why do you think it's a new profession? Why did it happen when it did? And why is it really taking off? Well, I think kind of multifactorial, the complexity of medicine has increased hundreds of fold over just the last probably 20, 30 years. And so for a patient to remain abreast, empowered, engaged, knowledgeable enough to be making a well-informed healthcare decisions has become more and more challenging. Mm -hmm. I think the time of um, face-to-face time with providers has been you know, slashed, much of the dismay of both the physicians and the patients. So there's just less of that time to hash it out, talk it out, ask your questions, make sure you understand. So with um, cutting the time spent, adding to the complexity of the healthcare maze, it really is a time where it, it seems that most patients wish they had um some additional advantage to see them through. And Annette, from a physician standpoint, I guess in the past, you never really saw a patient uprising where it became evident that people were becoming educated and empowered and were speaking up. How do physicians, how did they take this as this was unfolding, you know, seeing more and more people questioning, asking, I mean, not in unkind ways, but speaking for themselves? Right. I I think any good physician acknowledges and encourages their patients to be well-informed. But with that comes an additional onus on the physician to make certain that that information is good, appropriate, accurate, well-understood. So when they now have, with the age of you know the internet, now you have somewhat well-informed, not always well-informed, you have informed patients coming to the office. They've perhaps already researched what they think is going on. They've perhaps made their own diagnosis and have a treatment plan they'd like to have begun. And this is all before the physician even knows about the first symptom. So it kind of has added a dynamic that didn't used to exist. And again, I think a lot of it is welcome. Everybody wants their patients to be well-educated and well-informed, but it has added 
one more step, one more a bit of information that has to be gleaned from the patient to really see where they're at because they're not coming to you totally void of any pre-information uh, before that appointment. Absolutely. It's a new dynamic where both sides mm-hmm. need to get used to it. I do mm-hmm. get that. I see that. But it does behoove us as patients and family members to know what's going on. And we're going to talk about a safe hospital stay in a moment. But I want to go back to something that recently happened. I see that you were sought out by the news media to get your opinion last year when 14 wrongful death lawsuits were filed in Columbus against a doctor and unknown hospital staff after the hospital system identified 34 end-of-life patients who allegedly got excessive doses of fentanyl. Let's just talk about that and and from the the heart and the honesty standpoint Mm -hmm. of all of that. My first reaction as someone watching the news and hearing the story hit, same as anyone else's, I didn't want to believe it could be true. And if indeed it was, I wanted to hope that uh, some way, shape, or form we were being misinformed, that there was a misunderstanding, that there was going to be a a reasonable explanation just hadn't come forth. And I think the longer we moved along and and more facts were, were brought to the forefront, it at least became obvious to me and to many others that at times a hospital under the direction of, of folks who have um, maybe good intent, but perhaps not the standard um, intent of all their colleagues can make decisions and can carry out things that are detrimental to one's health. Mm-hmm. And knowing how to work in that environment, um, how to um, be savvy, smart, knowing that not every physician and everything that every physician puts out there as doctrine or or appropriate um, treatment is. It it really, um, unfortunately, puts the onus on a patient to, again, be engaged and well-informed and the, the days of just knowing I just need to do what I'm told to do, I need to question what I'm told to do and then I can decide or ask or suggested to do and I can I can go from there. And I think we just had a lot of folks who just really failed to question perhaps the system itself. And, and it's very unfortunate because 99.99% of the time I think the system is giving good information and it would behoove you to take that suggestion or orders and, and have it completed. But knowing how to sort out what's appropriate and what in this case was, I don't even have a word for it. Mm -hmm. It it is just really, really difficult. I think that the biggest piece of this is that when somebody is ill or somebody's in the hospital, uh, you aren't your best self. You're sick, your loved one's sick, just want relief or or peace or some answers. And that's that's not a very good time to be a critical listener and to question those things being suggested to be clear thinking. And if I ask everything I should ask, is there anything that doesn't add up here? Does it make sense? And I think when we're emotionally invested in a, in a situation, which is most of the time in a hospital, it's very difficult to be kind of at the top of your inquisitive game and make sure that you are getting all the information you need to make certain that you're staying safe and that the right things are being done. Right, right. And, and and therefore, the need for an outside advocate really comes in at a time like that, such as the work that you do. Yeah. At the very least, everyone, physicians included, I always encourage to have at least one other person. Once the, the initial pronouncement is made, like, I believe this could be cancer, or I think your loved one is gravely ill, and I, I'm not sure if, if they will necessarily survive this hospitalization, this procedure, this would... I think a lot of us go numb and we quit hearing anything that comes after that. And that's where it's really, really critical that you have someone else with you who can stand back and and be more objective in what's being heard, take good notes, ask good questions, make suggestions, look things up. And um, to be there alone in a room or making decisions by yourself, I think is is a really unfortunate place to, to find yourself. And I don't know if we're going to talk about later in the show, but this is where the risk for those with dementia and those who are aging alone, I think, is quite high. Yeah, let's talk about that dementia in the ER and ICU. Just a short personal story. When my mom was in the hospital for four months due to a missed diagnosis, I walked into her room one day to her telling me that there were huge bugs on the wall and the nurses were singing all night and that the vase of flowers on her tray table was a baby. And before I could even react, a nurse who was standing in the doorway very solemnly told me that my mom was showing signs of dementia. 
Now, fortunately for my mom, I was a diligent advocate. Not that I knew what I was doing, but I knew enough just to ask questions. And I asked to see her medication list, which ultimately was the cause of her confusion and hallucinations. Therefore, we we can talk about the need for somebody to be, especially with elder patients in ER, in ICU. And then my next question is, shouldn't medications be the first thing a healthcare provider should question before declaring that a patient has dementia? There are quite a few things. I mean, you've brought up a fairly unique but not uh, not unusual circumstance, and that is um, persons, not just elderly persons, but elderly persons are certainly more affected by it. And that is just the delirium, which is not a permanent state, it's, it's a temporary state that can come from being in a hospital setting. And it's a known fact. There's lots of research done. There are suggestions for things you can do to try and minimize that. But when you think about what happens in the hospital, you're away from home. Uh, Perhaps you've been made NPO, which means you're not allowed to take anything by mouth. So you're you're not eating. Um, You're having your vitals checked. Somebody, a stranger is coming up to your bedside if by chance you're asleep and someone's waking you out of a sleep to take your vitals, to draw blood, to take a chest x-ray, there's noises, there's beeping. The nurses might not be singing at the nurse's station, but they very well may be talking and and talking at a a volume that would be disruptive to someone trying to sleep in that same unit or hallway. So all of these things disrupt people's sleep cycle, disrupt their sense of orientation. Um, You may have a room that doesn't have a window. You may have a window but it looks out onto another portion of the building or a rooftop, so there's very little natural light coming in. And people very quickly become disoriented in a hospital to time and place and person, and you add to that illness, dehydration, perhaps infection, something else that would add to, you know, some temporary delirium or cognitive deficit. And you could very much look like someone who's totally different than how, for example, you saw your mother three days ago. And you're right, that's when it's really important for family or someone who knows them well to say, I know what you're saying, but I'm here to tell you that this individual is very clear of thinking, cognitively, you know, quite coherent, and this is very new and we need to look for a new reason for it. And yes, medications are one of those that you should certainly look for in a hospital, but oftentimes nothing has happened medically. It is just the uh, sheer act of being in a hospital that can really set people off uh, cognitively. You named a lot of things, and I think they all come together, dehydration, meds, sundowning, not knowing if it's day or night. There's a lot of things that come into play here. So it's something to keep in mind if you're especially looking after somebody and their behavior changes, right? Mm-hmm. Right. It's sometimes I think the most simple thing, and most people who are in healthcare or around the healthcare environment know that if an elderly person should suddenly be combative or confused or lethargic or not seeming to make good cognitive sense, the first thing you think of is is a urinary tract infection and what a normally benign thing, especially to younger individuals. But in the elderly population, it, it is paramount to consider that because it often is something as simple as that will tip the scale that will leave them terribly confused. Thank you for saying that. I hadn't thought about that. Mm -hmm. But now when I look back, I recall that often my mom did have UTIs and, and, and was creating different behavior. I hadn't thought of that in a long time. Thank you for mentioning that. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Now you talk about, you actually have a blog post that, uh, there's three things that patients can do to help ensure a safe hospital stay. So maybe share those. You know, one of them is being organized. And I also uh, talk out in the community about how to, uh, 10 ways to improve a a doctor's visit. So that's not even in the hospital, but it comes down to the same thing. And it really is just making certain that you're organized. And I always joke with folks, you know, I don't care if you were CEO or if you were the Brownie troop leader or you were committee member for a fundraiser, you didn't go into a meeting unprepared. So, you know, you probably had an agenda or the basic framework of an agenda so that you were certain you used time wisely You didn't walk out of the meeting with things unattended to or unaddressed that needed to be so that you could be successful with whatever it was that you were doing. And so I always tell people why in the world would something as important as your health care not be the same way. So I encourage them to to be very organized about that. Think about what you want to say. Think about what questions you want to ask. 
whether it be hospital or an outpatient appointment, coming prepared with as much information as you possibly can. Not only will that be something you can rely upon to explain, you know, circumstances as they are, but uh, oftentimes I've had clients who they want to turn around and repeat the same things that they just had done, maybe in another healthcare system or by another physician. If you have that there, you've just saved yourself a couple of steps and some duplicity by saying, you know, I did have a chest x-ray and I did have an EKG and I have those reports right here. And I always tell people if they think they're going to the ER or the hospital, if you have advanced directives, um, I I always encourage them to bring them along. Medications and allergies, I, the easiest thing is to have them all in a bag. You can write them down, you can put them on a card and put it in your wallet, that's fine too. But sometimes just having them all in a bag so that you can see when you last refilled them, what doctor prescribed them, all the current providers. It's hard to come up with a name when you're not feeling well and you're kind of under the gun and they're, well, who, who does this and who does that? So if you have a list of all your providers, I think that's helpful. So the more you can bring to the table, the better care you're going to get. And, and I think just being organized about it is, is the best way to do that. Excellent, excellent. It's all about being empowered and taking care of yourself. You talk on your website, and I thought this was so important. You say, slow down the process. And I found that so many times working with other folks where they'll call me and say, Pat, I was just diagnosed with this, or my doctor said I have to have surgery tomorrow or the next day. And it's like, whoa, everything is not an emergency. And some things obviously are, but sometimes it's not. So let's just talk briefly right. about why we should stop for a minute, take a breath, and Mm -hmm. slow down that process? Well, that's a wonderful question to ask right there. So if perchance you've been given a new diagnosis and then you're hit with, you know, three or four things that need to be done, you know, you haven't even absorbed nor do you maybe fully understand what the potential diagnosis is, right? There's a first place to slow it down. I hear that you're saying a lot of things need to be done about this diagnosis. And <laughs> can you say it? Can you spell it? Can you tell me what that means? Can you send me to some places where I can get some really good information about it. And then again, if you're getting the, the idea that this needs to be done tomorrow, we're going to send you over here the next day. Again, just asking that simple question because medicine does kind of work at a breakneck speed at, at times and other times it seems to move far too slowly. <laughs> but asking that very question, I'm sensing that this is very, very urgent and these things need to be done very quickly and the time is of the essence, you know, or is it true or do I have time? You know, could I, I'd like to have one of my children fly in to be able to go to some of these things with me or, you know, I just would like to learn about this a little bit more so that I can understand what course we're taking. So sometimes just asking that very question, is it as pressing and as time sensitive as I'm feeling right now? And many times somebody will say, oh, no, did it come off that way? Mm -hmm. Because you don't really realize what kind of an impression you've left with someone. You're just trying to get all the right things done and all the, the boxes checked and in, in to the, the diagnosis and treatment plan. But asking that, you know, would a couple of days make a difference? Or if they say, no, take some time, do you mean like a day or so? Or do you mean that I might, you know, it would be all the same if I took a week? And then asking if I choose or move forward with this right now, what are what are the consequences or what would the potential consequences be to my health? Just like you said, you, you need to understand that so that you can make good decisions that are fitting your priorities in your, your life. So much work for the patient, isn't it? <laughs> there is. There is. I've had quite a few people tell me that. <laughs> um, <laughs> and we're back to where we were at the beginning. Healthcare is so complex. We don't just have a couple of agents to treat a particular disease process. You know, this option, that option. It's all good stuff. It's all there, and, and people are living longer in so many disease processes than they ever have, but it's because of just the complexity mm -hmm. and the sheer volume of options that we have today. And back to the slowing it down, this is one of my mantras. I always have told people, especially when we're talking about cancer, unless you've been told that it is uh, time is of the essence, and, and maybe even so then, maybe get someone like an advocate to help you escalate your time schedule. But I always encourage people to get a second opinion. Mm -hmm. I've had numerous situations where um, clients would be in a totally different place had they taken their first diagnosis to heart um, and either, in some cases, done way more than they needed to have done and in other cases, just as unfortunately, had been encouraged to do absolutely nothing and it would have been detrimental to the value and the quality of life that they had led than if they had gotten a second opinion and realized that there was some life value altering 
on treatments that could give them more time, more time to reconcile family, more time to be with their spouse, more time to feel better as they lived with their chronic or terminal illness. Slow down and and ask somebody else what their opinion is. Excellent, excellent. And you know, as you're saying this, I'm hoping that on the flip side, that healthcare providers who are listening to this and eventually reading this in our book will understand the patient side that it's too much for a patient to think of all these things. So maybe when they're delivering these conversations, they could keep that in mind to say, okay, Mm -hmm. this, this isn't an emergency or here's how this works, or maybe just take that extra bit of time Mm -hmm. to make sure Mm -hmm. that the patient really does understand and can consume what's happening. Yeah. And I think another thing in there is oftentimes I have clients and and I want to say they tend to be my older clients, but not always that really, really feel as though it is, um, disrespectful and not honoring the profession for them to ask these questions, to ask to slow it down. Heaven forbid, get a second opinion because it's somehow saying to your physician that you don't trust them or you don't trust what they've said or suggested or or ordered. In this day and age, that, that is not where medicine is. Your physician doesn't think less of you for getting a second opinion or, or taking time to discuss it or, or ask questions. I, I think they'll be quite honored that you are empowered to do that. And then in the rare circumstance, and, and I do think they're fairly rare, where someone does take offense to the fact that you don't take what they've said and, and the plan in place at face value and just begin right then and there without stepping back or getting a second opinion. I think that that's probably the one time the second opinion is really warranted. And again, you shouldn't feel uncomfortable bringing that second person with you. And if you you don't have that person or you feel like the situation calls for something more than your sister, then consider a private patient advocate. Excellent. And you are located in Westerville, Ohio. That's in the Columbus area, right? Yep. Columbus. Yes. So I serve clients in Columbus. I serve clients out of state. Yeah, there's so much that can be done, again, even remotely. So much can be done these days with technology. I often accompany patients remotely to appointments. It's as simple as just having a cell phone and the doctor's permission to do so. Mm-hmm. Um, and an advocate or family member can listen in to um, the visit and then respectfully come up with their questions, you know, at the end, not to interrupt the flow of things, Mm -hmm. but then come up with whatever might be appropriate. Yeah, so I do that for people around the country, as do other advocates. It's really added to the number of people that we're able to serve. All right, well, then why don't you give us your contact information, where folks can go to learn more about you and how they can contact you. Sure. The website is www.gps, like the map that's in your car, also stands for Guided Patient Services, so it's gpscolumbus.com, www.gpscolumbus.com. There's a contact form there as well. I will be the one calling you because there's no there's no one else in the <laughs> office but me to call. So I would be more than happy to um, entertain any questions that people have about advocacy and when it might be appropriate for them to consider that. All righty. So we're speaking with Dr. Annette Tecoris, also a board-certified patient advocate, owner of Guided Patient Services. And the website is gpscolumbus.com. Well, before we leave, any final words, especially as it pertains to heart humor or honesty in healthcare? They're all important. Humor, humor and laughter is the best medicine. So there's your humor part. Be kind to your heart. And honesty, there is no better policy. And that goes for healthcare too. So be honest with your physician and uh, find a physician who'll be honest right back with you. Yay. Oh, you're so amazing. Thank you so much for sharing this information today. Thank you. Listen to Pat Rulo and Speak Up and Stay Alive Radio. Stay safe from little known healthcare and hospital hazards. To learn more, go to speakupandstayalive.com. That's speakupandstayalive.com.